Good morning and welcome back to the channel. Today is going to be the final day of me doing a review for the particular uh, package uh, Wild Eye had sent me from a, um, about a month or two ago. Um, I think this is like the 14th title I've done in the horror uh, or in the under their banner. Uh, let's get started. Today's movie is Acid Path. Uh, let's see, I don't know if I wrote down the year. Yeah, okay, I did. It's from 2006. It came out on April 1st of 2006 in the United States. Clocks in at about an hour and 16 minutes, and it's unrated. Um, currently gets a 5.2 on IMDb. It's considered action, crime, and horror. Um, I haven't really found out an awful lot of information on the movie because it's got limited uh, info on it. Um, it's not currently playing on Tubi, I'm guessing because of the uh, graphic nature of the film, maybe, because it is part of the Raw, raw and Extreme Wild Eye line. Uh, I believe it, I, the spine says number 30, like right, right here, like right here, it says number 30. Uh, the tagline is only this insane will survive. A crazed member is on the loose and he's, he's got the local nightlife on the run. The hooker network has organized a game plan to save themselves from their own uh, unknown killer in a conflict between the crime syndicate and a reckless bounty hunter. Their fates will be decided in a flash. Well, the film is directed by Lou Garcia, Annette Martinez, Writers Lou Garcia and Annette Martinez as well. Stars Linda Amistad as Nasty Lynn Sweetburger, which is basically in a movie scene that the people are watching. I don't know why. I mean, other than maybe because she's a bigger star, I have no idea. I don't really know the actress. Uh, but it says she stars in it. Mike Bilodeau as Mike. Eric Campus as Alexander Kristoff. Uh, Chris DeLeon De as Taco. John Evans as Kev, and Mario Faw as Crow. Uh, there's some movie connections in this movie as well. Uh, adjust your tracking from 2013. Uh, you can see the case of the particular movie in a, in a frame in the movie, which is a, a movie tie-in. And then you see uh, the movie Cannibal Maniac is playing in a, in a t on a TV during a key scene. Uh, Cannibal Maniac is from 2003. Um, this currently comes in uh, English and Spanish. I, I couldn't seem to find the Spanish uh, subtitle, or you know, for when the subtitles for Spanish when they were speaking Spanish. I don't know if I couldn't. It's just I wasn't looking in the right spot, but I couldn't seem to find it. Um, so when they're Spanish speaking, you basically don't. You basically have to just guess what they're saying, and you kind of just go with it, because it's not throughout or anything, but it's here and there. And if it doesn't have subtitles, it's a tad bit annoying a little, because I, I don't know what I missed really. I mean, I kind of put together what I did, but I really can't put it together in the words, you know, in the review here. Uh, the filming locations were done in Los Angeles and California. The production companies were Warp Reality Pictures and. The distributor, of course, is Wild Eye Releasing. Uh, that was released in 2015. And the budget was an incredible $20,000. Uh, this movie looked easily into the hundred to 200000 range, maybe even more. They did an amazing job on a $20,000 budget. Uh, basically, the film starts out, uh, it shows the city scenery, kind of like to kick off the movie. Kind of, Kind of almost like... Kind of almost like a trauma way of starting, like it'd show around like Jersey and things like this. But um, this is in California, or at least that's what it what I what was uh, found out about the movie. Basically, it's showing sit people on the city streets, and it's usually and mostly it's showing like uh, prostitutes and things like that. Uh, we get a shot of a girl in the shower, a uh, man in a winter mask. You know, you, I don't know if you know what a winter mask is, but that's what we refer to them around here. And a meat cleaver is watching her shower, and he has this very disdained look for her, a maniacal look on, on his face, if you will. Uh, and then he chops her with a cleaver, and we are uh, hear her screaming, and we assume, you know, she's obviously being chopped up by the killer. 
Uh, then we see our killer uh, preparing to drain all of her blood down the bath bathtub drain, and he's prepared to uh, keep the evidence to a minimum, other than you know, uh, pour, uh, pouring acid into the bath water. Uh, he's got plastic everywhere to you know kind of conceal the blood a little bit. Uh, they keep showing a really it's a pretty cool nod here. They keep showing Night of the Living Dead from time to time. Like, uh, when they're not showing the killer do stuff. Uh, then he's taking her organs and he's putting them into a cooler. So I'm assuming he's not really like what I call a full-blown killer. I, I think he's doing it for a price. That's pretty much what I've got so far in this movie. Because he's, well, not yet, but later on. Uh, we then get a shot of the two, uh, two prostitutes that are talking to, uh, about their John's. On that night, we see our killer happens to be the the John for the one girl. Oh. He kind of uh, sees the second roommate as he's walking into the room. And he kind of gives her a creepy look. look and the scene kind of closes out like... I can't remember if she left. I think she left because the one prostitute was going to be with, with the killer. Well... The unknown killer to them, obviously. Uh, we then see a man with really long hair. Uh, this is the next morning. Uh, we see a man with long hair in the, in the top parking garage, in the top of a parking garage. It turns out it's a bust of sorts. Uh, a man, a, a man grab, grabs a bag that is carrying an automatic weapon, and he begins to open fire um, at this bounty uh, hunter named. Uh, Tommy uh, the two exchange rounds of bullets at each other the man makes a run for it on foot uh, and the bounty hunter Tommy uh, clips him on the inner thigh and he falls and he tries to plea with the bounty hunter uh, with him several times but the bounty hunter's uh, more or less here to kill you know get, get him or kill him whatever and he's he's a bit I feel he's a little bit bloodthirsty, but I mean, he think I think in his line of uh, field, uh, line of field, you have to be. And he opens fire on the kill uh, on the long-haired man, and he keeps shooting him and shooting him, and shooting him, and then he falls off the roof, off the top of the parking garage, and onto the ground, and then dies. Uh, this scene. Um, he goes around down later to pick the body up and throw it in the back of his blazer. Uh, this movie at this point kind of comes off a little bit like Grindhouse-like because it does have your grain, your grains, uh, your lines, and you know throughout like here and there. It's a really grainy film, and I love the the vibe it has in it throughout. Uh, the next scene, we see our killer uh, with a body in a tub. Of acid, and, and he's uh, uh, pulling uh, pulling apart the skin tissue on the body, uh, and he's going out of his apartment, and he's got a plastic bag. I guess he's trying to get rid of the. I don't know if he's trying to get rid of the stuff that he doesn't need from the body, uh, and obviously not the organs. Uh, he's approached by a, a crazy girl that's in this that. Kind of gets every, under everybody's skin a little bit. They called her crazy something. I can't really remember. They didn't really say her name an awful lot. Uh, but she's getting on his nerves. And, I, and he's really dodging a bullet here. Because he's got this evidence in his hand. With a dead body. You know. Pieces of a dead body in a bag. Uh, she eventually leaves him alone. But it, but as he she leaves. She flips she flips him off. I'm no, it's no lie. She does some really funny but corny things at the same time throughout. Uh, close call here, if you will, for our uh, killer. He he kind of dodges a bullet here. And then we see a uh, a trifecta of uh, streetwalkers or prostitutes meeting in a parking garage. And like I said, I love the graininess of this film. Uh, the one girl is asking the other two if they have the money, and I'm, at this point I'm kind of like befo befounded at what's going on. Um, I had no idea. 
Uh, not overly sure what the money was for at this point, but I later discovered it was to pay the bounty hunter to take out this killer because he's uh, their co-workers are starting to dwindle and no bodies are showing up. We then get a random shot of a couple of girls outside of a movie theater and we are... Uh, we ever, From time to time during the scene with the two girls, they keep uh, flash panning to uh, a slaughterhouse with pigs. I don't know if they're uh, like they're he like they're, the message is is that the killer is treating these prostitutes like slaughtered pigs. Uh, but anyway, they give uh, the girls the two girls prior give her the money for the to get the bounty hunter after him, and but then the two girls outside the movie theater they are this they're. Uh, Talking about their cheapest trick they've ever done, which was pretty, you know, pretty funny, pretty funny line, uh, part of the movie. Um, we then go back to the parking garage where the three prostitutes are. This time the killer is uh, stalking the girl who wanted the money from the other two. The other ladies that went away. I love the mu uh, music in this part of the film, very 70s, 80s like. The girl that takes the money uh, hears slight noises off in the distance and begins to pick up her pace as she's walking. Um, she uh, starts to run across the garage and makes it to the door, and but not before her, our killer gets to her. And it appears it's either stuck or locked. I'm going to say jammed, maybe, or could have been locked. But she couldn't get to it. And the way it's shot in this scene is like, the killer's not even really there, but it's like they shot it in a different room and then they, like, showed him bringing down a meat cleaver. It just, it's really cool how they did it. Like, it's a very unique way of, uh, they shot it. Having, like, a twin scene, kind of like, like, there's this one frame, he's doing the chopping motion, like, and then the blood shoots. And then, like, it looks like he's looking way down on her. It's almost like he's gi gigantic and she's, like, little. Like, there's a... Like, it was done intentionally that way. Uh, very supernatural-like in a way they did it a little bit. Uh, you have to see it to, uh, for yourself to know what I'm, I'm talking about. It's kind of a little hard. I've never seen a kind of uh, visionary sh uh, scene shot like that before. But then he takes the body away, and he does take her money as well, which is never going to be you know seen by our uh, bounty hunter in the movie. Our killer is then seen taking what looks to be organs in a cooler to a man who looks to be wanting the organs. And um, at this point, I'm not sure if they revealed his name. But they, uh, the killer sets down with this uh, like crime lord kind of you know guy, kind of a scumbag, scumbaggy guy. Um, they hang out and they're watching a, a little bit of a violent TV show while drinking beer. We then see a uh, third guy there with, who takes the cooler that has the organs in it to a warehouse and uh, he leaves the cooler there. He comes uh, back to the house. The guys begin to talk about what, they're, what they need to do about this bounty hunter that will be soon on their tail if they're not careful. Uh, at this point I don't really know what's going on because they're not speaking English. Um, that's the part I kind of got like out of it a little bit. Not not because it's not a good movie at this point. It's been great so far, but it's just I don't know what's being said, and I couldn't find the subtitles. Uh, we then see our killer in the subway system with a prostitute. The scene is a, a bit mind trippy and a bit confusing for me at this point. I didn't know if it was like a dream because it was just seemed it kind of got like thrown in there. Uh, but then the next. Uh, uh, next scene, the bounty killer, the bounty hunter's talking with another prostitute, drinking coffee. I don't know if she came to his house like an informant or, or what. It was kind of weird. I don't think he would have been dating a prostitute unless he was seeing her, you know, paid for her services on this night. And she's drinking coffee and talking about how all the girls on the street are starting to disappear and bot no bodies are showing up. It appears the girls were, uh, as I say, they were rounding up money to pay him to take out this killer. 
he assures her that he's going to go take a look at, at the parking garage because uh, apparently the, one of the girls uh, that she's friends with was the one in the parking garage. And he takes a look around and he can't find anything. And he reaches the garage uh, further in and, it looked, and he's looking for the girl up and down. And while uh, doing so, he's approached by the third guy that had the cooler that he was taking the uh, organs to the warehouse. Um, for some reason, the movie gets really Bruce Lee-like here. <laughs> he starts wh whipping out this, like, uh, uh, more or less like a Donatello kind of, like, stick or whatever. He starts swinging it around <laughs> from uh, Ninja Turtles. And... Um, they they begin to fight, and the henchmen uh, uh the lead the basically the lead um guy in this that's a um like a drug lord or whatever he is like a black market kind of scumbag in this movie is Santos. I just saw it here later on, but that's San that's one of Santos's men that uh, the bounty hunter fights with in the parking garage. Uh, our bounty hunter uh. Uh, basically beats him up, uh, but then when he beats him up, he uh, take, looks at his wallet, and he uh, just kind of like looks to see who he is, but the henchman is, has a very close tie with uh, our villain Santos in this. We get a shot of a construction yard later on where a couple, uh, a couple men are carrying weapons, uh, the bounty hunter's watching with this crazy girl that I mentioned that the killer, uh, like I say, it's like, it seems like the bounty hunter's got like some informants or something like around the city. Um, they're testing Santos' security system because Santos owes him money. Uh, uh, the bounty hunter got a tip about all of this, so he's, that's why he's there watching. Uh, the guys are here to collect from Santos. At this point, all the guys are, uh, pointing guns at each other, and there's a standoff until a fight breaks out. Santos' men gra get the upper upper hand while our hunter and the girl are, are uh, they're all having a good laugh at what's going on, because uh, it's, you know, trash, uh, trashy people taking out trashy people. Uh, but at, soon after, the trespassers that come to Santos' backyard are chased off by Santos' dogs. Uh, at this point, the movie at times they would do these flashback scenes with just random scene scene shots. It felt very uh, Rob Zombie inspired at times, uh, kind of like out of date uh, video vignettes and uh, really weird, creepy, I don't know, like unexplainable things going on. Kind of like mess with your mind, kind of thing. Kind of like playing head games a little bit. But then it goes back to where our killer. A scene with uh, a pr her the prostitute that he seems to never really ever harm, which is really weird because every girl he's ever usually with or, or approaches, they end up in his bathtub and the acid acid and you know are left or you know they're obviously killed, um, but he wants her to he pays her for stupid you know weird weird role playing kind of things. Uh, it's pretty creepy the way he has her posing and pretending she's dead uh, when she's not, obviously. He's, like, taking pictures. Of, I don't know if he's trying to picture her later on being dead. I have no idea. It's just kind of a weird, creepy scene, like, like what you know, how she's complying with, you know, pretending to be dead. And, uh, just, just kind of bent, if you will. We then see a girl working the streets after he leaves uh, his uh, usual uh, prostitute. We then see a girl working the streets while being annoyed by a weird customer that is a bit of a cheap wad and he wants to do things with her, but uh, she doesn't charge that little and she just kind of shuns him away. She leaves him behind. Uh, they do a good job of capturing the grittiness at this point in the nightlife scenes on the street as well. Uh, we then see our killer driving up to this girl later on after she shuns the cheapo, cheapo away in a car. But it appears uh, she knows him 
she gets in the car with him and she asks if it's her place or his place. And I assume it ends up his place because he has all these uh, weapons of destruction, if you will. At this point, I'm guessing it's his house, in other words. And he awaits for her to uh, come into the house where he wraps plastic around her head and begins to suffocate her. Uh, he kills her, but he gets a knock on the door. Uh, and it turns out it's our our crazy girl. The killer must know the killer must know the crazy girl in this movie because uh, she always shows up at the you know it seems the most annoying times for him. Like she knows when he comes home. I think he, she must be a neighbor. But they uh, but they leave. Uh, she owes him. He owes her money. I can't remember if it's for a TV maybe or so. I don't. I can't remember what she kept uh, bothering him about. Uh, another again another close call because he's uh, he's got her all but dead and he's getting ready to throw her in there. She's already in the uh, tub and he's ready to pour the acid into the uh, water. He's in full gear at this point, so he can't really go to the door. Uh, he pours it in, and it begins to melt the, the prostitute's skin down to the bone. Uh, sorry about the graphicness, but this this isn't really a graphic film but based on the cover like you think it would be. It could have been a lot worse in terms of gra uh, graphic, uh, you know, very, like, gross out moments if you will considering the idea this is uh, a very violent it's not a very violent scene for what it could have been with a body and acid uh, it could have been much worse uh, next scene the media is uh, on the TV talking about what the uh, people disappearing at this point and it, the, the local cops won't do anything because they can't find anybody there's no proof of any, you know, bodies or anything. Uh, we see our hunter training upon hearing about the Phantom Killer. Uh, police that are at a standstill at this point, and they need uh, an ounce of proof before they'll do anything. Uh, the next scene, we see our killer trying to come a, a little bit unraveled about all the killing he's doing. We get... Uh, some more Rob Zombie inspired visions in this scene as well. Kind of like him going off the rails and visionary scenes of shots that are like not making a lot of sense to us still. Our killer is at it again. More night prowling, if you will. And at this point, he's kind of going a little bit bonkers over killing uh, women. And I, I, it's like he's trying to get caught by the police because he's going to, you know... The more you kill, eventually, the more you're going to get sloppy, and the more, you know, the better chances are you're going to get caught or someone's going to see you. Uh, and at this point, uh, let's see. Our killer is at it again. Uh, more night prowling, if you will. At the rate, like I said, the rate he's going, he's going to be getting caught. Uh, and then uh, I don't know if it's the next morning or later that night. I think it's, the, I think it's the next morning. We get a shot of a lady interviewing a psychic crime profiler. His job is to tell the public and authorities, and you know, and his uh, people that buy his book, uh, what kind of monsters to be looking for. You know, like basically profiling what makes a serial killer or, you know, or whatever. And he seems to know what he's looking for in this killer that's running around right now. He's kind of given his opinion to the uh, reviewer or news lady um, who to be looking for on the city streets. And, he, you know, he's he has a lot of expertise in this field, and he knows what makes a killer tick. Uh, it shows the profiler later that day going to his hotel room and he's uh, I guess he's having problems or issues with his uh, um, agent uh, I don't know if it's something to do with his book or whatever but he's uh, kind of being sidetracked with that but it shows our killer I don't know how he would have gotten his address but I don't know it might have been might not have been his hotel maybe he lived out of a hotel I'm not sure because they do list it in a telephone book page 
uh, kind of a dated reference, considering most people do not even use. Uh, I, I think that's why I say that I think this movie might not have taken place in our in the you know 2020 time frame in terms of what it was based on. Uh, but he finds the killer finds this profiler's address in the phone book, and he pays him a visit. And this is a pretty brutal scene. It's probably one of the more brutal scenes. Well, the last scene in the movie is the most brutal. But it's a really brutal film, or part of the film. He shoots him, which you would have thought would have been enough. But then he can continually stabs him in the head repeatedly. Uh, as I say, it's a very graphic scene. Um, Uh, and then he goes to the lady's house, or the prostitute that he never seems to want to harm in this movie. Uh, he pulls out a machete, uh, and he blares the music. Uh, and this is when you know she's going to meet her demise, because you can tell he's he's gone full, full-blown full killer. Uh, he does kill her, and like I say, he turns up the sound of the music. And he begins to chop her up with a machete, this old, older-fashioned uh, machete. Uh, then we see a next scene with uh, Santos's henchman trying to get the drop on the bounty hunter in his apartment. Uh, he tries to choke him with a rope, but the bounty hunter is way too skilled for uh, the, this, uh, the same henchman that tried to jump him in the parking garage. Uh, but uh, our bounty hunter shoots him, kills him, and... And he falls into his uh, bathtub, and he's all bloodied. And, you know, obviously dead. He's had multiple uh, rounds of ammo put in him. Uh, the hunter then knows at this point that it's Santos's men. He calls Santos and lets him know that his buddy is no longer. Uh, they exchange their pleasantries, <laughs> and the war is on more or less between Santos and the bounty hunter. And he tells Santos, I'll see you soon. And this is where the movie gets really 80s inspired with the ninja ninja feel and, and like the, the shoot him up scenes and stuff. The movie has an 80s ninja revenge feel to it. That that's what I that's the the vibe I got it like an 80s ninja revenge feel to it, kind of like an American ninja kind of thing. Uh, at this point, Santos has gone on full lockdown for the hunter. In, uh, or Tommy, if you will, at the warehouse. Santos is, uh, at this point, his men are on, on edge because they know Tommy uh, means business. He's a one-man uh, killing machine because uh, they know he's been uh, trained in the martial arts. And, you know, I, I think he had prior military service as well. Uh, he begins to take out each member uh, via... Uh, by a art, artillery fashion, if you will, or, or weapons, uh, Santos's little group are starting to dwindle at the warehouse. All I could think of is this: these they were buying these body parts to put on the black market, and they were taking them to a warehouse so he could uh, Santos could make big money off them to sell to people that were looking for certain body parts. That's all I could figure out what was going on by the end. Uh, that is until the man runs into the actual killer, or Tommy runs into the killer in the group, and he, he, uh, Tommy's going hand-to-hand -hand with the killer. Uh, the killer's no match for him in terms of skill and, you know, the way he's fighting. But like I say, Tommy's mu uh, much more trained and faster. Uh, he gets the upper hand on him. Uh, he's about to finish off the killer, but then Santos comes up from behind him and stabs him with a broken beer bottle causing uh, Tommy to kind of be, you know, uh, more or less be in a weakened state. Uh, him and uh, Tommy and Santos begin to go at it, and at this point, Tommy's kind of beaten up because he's already went through so many men. He's had, you know, encounters with so many. He's probably uh, spent at this point. Uh, Tommy, uh, at some point, gets put on the ground by Santos, and Santos keeps uh, kicking him, and he's really weak at this point. Uh, while Tommy's down, Santos grabs two old uh, machetes, and he wants to kill Tommy with them. But um, Tommy, I think, uses his, uh, kind of gets to his side and uses his legs to kick him away. Uh, 
he gets them away from Santos so he can't use them. Uh, and then um, Tommy kind of gets a re bit of a rejuvenation and um, gets to um, fight Santos again. And at this at this point, he's kind of trying to you know give one last uh, ditch effort to fight Santos, and he decapitates Santos via the machete. At this, uh, like I said, at this point, Tommy's really drained. Uh, and all he keeps doing well, after he kills Santos is kind of thinking about things like in his head. Like you can see he's like, like really, you know, heavily uh, drained at this point. So this leaves Tommy and the killer. And the, the killer don't want no more of Tommy at this point because, you know, he knows he can't beat him physically. Even though he's kind of weaker, but so is the killer because Tommy did a pretty good number on him. But the killer walks off into the night. And at this point, he, he goes out on the street and seeks another girl. Uh, but not before uh, the girl that wanted her money sneaks in uh, while he's doing this. And she shoots him from behind and continues to keep shooting him. Because uh, she plain out don't like him. And it's just kind of like, it definitely, and the way it ended was so sudden. It kind of felt a little bit Quentin Tar Tarantino-ish with uh, Death Proof. I think he did Death Proof. It, it kind of ended really sudden, but then our killer falls into the vat of uh, acid, and he's totally melting to the bone. This is a really graphic scene. Uh, really, this is the most graphic scene in the movie. I ain't going to go into detail about how, how graphic it is, but that's the way it ends. It's a really solid uh, horror film about a... Kind of like a semi-slasher to a degree. Uh, my thoughts on the movie was it was uh, very fast-paced. It went by really fast. It's a really short movie. Uh, I was expecting it to be much more violent based on the cover and the name Acid Bath. Uh, but it, it, it was a uh, graphic here and there, but it was no different than, say, anything from trauma in terms of, you know what I mean, like, like graphicness. But I really liked it. I had fun with it. I, I liked the throwback feel it had from like the 70s and 80s. The the uh, grindhouse feel it had to it. And like I said, it, it basically ended like so abruptly like you wanted more. But you know when the killer fell into it. Um, maybe they'll have a sequel, Acid Bath 2, with a new killer. Maybe a different storyline. I really look forward to that. <clears throat> and kind of keep the... I don't mind graphicness to a degree, but I don't like them getting too gross out. Like, I watched a movie from years ago called Bone Sickness. That one was just sickness for the sake of making it sick, you know. And uh, I didn't really like that one too well. But this one, this one's a very, really good one. Um, I just wish it would have had this, this cover right here on the disc as the cover. Because I like that. I like that look of that one. And plus, you can see it a little better. But that's my review for Acid Bath. A very, uh, very fun slasher film. I really liked it. It wasn't really all slasher. It had a, a lot of action adventure in it as well. Uh, if it could have been full slasher, I would have liked it that much more. But I do highly recommend it. I had fun with it. Um, that wraps up my uh, Wild Eye review uh, package that I got from them recently. Thank you for watching. Please share, like, and subscribe. And I'll be back with more reviews in the future, everybody. Take care and uh, stay safe out there during, during this variant pandemic stage we're in right now. See you later. Bye.